For at TV, the world is thinking. I learned some things along the way that I'd kind of ignored. And right around the middle of my career, I started putting these things into work. And the things that I learned along the way was that the men in the office were really not that different from the men that I knew outside the office. And I'd been practicing pretty diligently on my father, my brother, my boyfriends, and all the men that I ever ran into outside of work. And I was pretty good at handling these men. I was great with my father. I even got my brother to kind of slip into action there. But, but when, I, when it came to the men at work, I really wasn't, I wasn't treating them the same way. I was, I was always angry at them. And if, I didn't, if things didn't go my way, or if somebody changed my copy, or if somebody did something I didn't like, I would just go crazy. Well, the men don't like it when you go crazy. It makes them very nervous. They don't know what you're going to do next. <gasps> She's too emotional. When they say we're too emotional, they're not talking about, oh, we cry at Hallmark commercials. They're talking about we get angry. Our anger is the only emotion a man really has a hard time dealing with because he doesn't know what you're going to do next. They've told me this. I say, why do you get, why do you get so upset when we get angry? Because we don't know what you're going to do next. And they feel the same way if they see you cry. We don't know what you're going to do next. Oh, I'm going to cry. I'm, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world. But. So I developed um, certain tactics for handling the men that I work with. And, and because I'm in advertising, because I'm in, my background has been advertising writing and advertising ideas, I kind of gave labels to these things that I thought would get people's attention. And one of the labels that I talk about in the book is the art of S&M. And the men, their eyes light up when they hear this because they think I'm talking about, you know, S&M. But I'm really talking about uh, seduction and manipulation. And I could have easily have said that one of the tactics I used on men when I finally saw the light, had my epiphany, was charm and cajoling. But I honestly and truly, if I had a chapter in the book that said the art of CNC, I wouldn't be here today. Nobody would have been, nobody would be interested in what I had to say. And one of the other reasons that I use this word manipulation is because I wanted women to feel a sense of power. I didn't want them to feel like, oh, you have to... You know, you have to use your feminine wiles, you have to bat your eyelashes, you have to, you know, cajole them into doing what you want them to do or taking you seriously. I wanted to say, manipulate the situation. But do it in a way that isn't vicious, that isn't selfish, and isn't self-serving. And so if you read this book, you'll see that I'm constantly talking about benevolent manipulation or manipulation where everybody wins because you're trying to help people, not just the men, but all the people in your world do something better, either be better at what they do or better at how their, their relationships with other people or doing a better job for the client or something that is rewarding not just for you, but for them and for the people that they affect in their everyday life. And if you can do that, nobody has ever in my entire career has ever gotten mad at me because they thought I was manipulating them. In fact, when this book came out, I thought must have, I must have thought I would be living in China when this book came out. But I, because the book came out and all the men at McCann Erickson now are reading the book, and they have either two reactions. They either come in and say, we thought you loved us. Or they say, well, you, you never manipulated me, right? <laughs> and the fact is that I do, I do love them. And that's one of the reasons why I was good with them is because even when they were behaving badly and I was trying to correct their attitude, I, they knew that I cared about them. And so I would say things like, you are such a little... Prick. I don't know why I love you so much. I don't know what, you are so annoying right now. I don't know why you're so important to me. So they would be totally confused. Are they a jerk or are they important or are they behaving badly or are they, am I mad at them or what? What's going on? And I think that if, if I led with the bad things, they would turn me off. They would just stop listening to me. So I always try to get their attention first. And the thing that gets the attention of men more than anything else is love. They love to be loved. They love it when you love them and you appreciate them and you approve of them and you don't criticize them and you don't make them feel badly about the terrible things that they're doing. 
And so I learned that uh, after spending 15 years of my career yelling at them and not, not getting anywhere, not, not being happy myself, and certainly not making any points with them. And then I went to Chicago to be the creative director of J. Walter Thompson, and I had an epiphany that that I was gonna use different tactics to get the people in that office, especially the men. It was very male, it was a very testosterone-driven office. To get the men to be better men, to work better with each other, to collaborate more, to have a couple of the you know, female skills that we do instinctively really well. Listening, um, um, having empathy, having instincts, being able to walk in a room and know who wants to kill you and who really likes you. And I think that's a skill that men don't pay attention to. They walk into a room because they know that everybody in that room is just gonna fall down dead over them because they're great. And they are great, but you don't have to, but even if you're great, there are gonna be people who want you dead. You have to be able to recognize who those people are. At least don't put your back to them. Women understood that instinctively, and I always wanted women in the, in the meeting, because they would come back from the meeting and I'd say, how'd it go? All anybody ever wants to hear when you come back from a meeting and they say, how'd it go? They just want to hear you say, great. It went great. And so the men always say that, how'd it go? Great. I'm gonna do this and this and bing, bang, bing, bang, gonna test everything, everything's great. No problems. And the women are going, they stared at our collarbones the whole time. Nobody made eye contact. The head guy was leaning, was, had his back to the office, back to us with his arms closed and kept rolling, literally, literally rolling away from the table with his chair. He couldn't get farther enough away from us. This meeting did not go well. They said we could test everything, but you really need to call them. And sure enough, we're in deep doo doo. We're going to get fired because we're not listening to them. And it wasn't that the men were stupid and the women were smart. It was just that the way a man's brain works is he has a preconceived idea of how something should go based on how prepared he is. These guys knew that they were prepared for this meeting and they had good work. And they heard the client say, okay, we'll test everything. It confirmed what they already believed going into the meeting. If the client had said anything negative, they wouldn't have remembered that because they knew that they had the work. The women are listening with their eyes. And so you want to have women in the room who are senior enough to make their feelings known and to debrief you from the other side, you know, from a person whose left brain is actually talking to their right brain and who will look at a room and be able to tell what's going on.